So um, I just, as a little introduction, um, we, we might wonder why we decided to do this conference today and how we came up with the title Transforming Passive Care, Evolution or Revolution. It actually came from um, a group of us going to the Hospice UK conference in October. I'd just been in post for about four months, so the hospice movement was very new to me and I really didn't understand the whole totality of hospice care and hospice services. Um, there was Nikki, there was Rebecca, there was Doug, and there was Teresa. The, four, the five of us went to the, to the conference. Uh, Doug and Rebecca and Nikki actually did post presentations that were fantastically successful at the conference, I have to say. And when we came back, we thought, we need to share this information. We need to sort of share the learning that we've had during this fantastic event. And so we came up with the conference today. And again, the very much the theme of the conference is around this notion of evolution and revolution. And we've been incredibly lucky to get Tracy to come today to actually share with us those sort of key messages that came from the conference and things that have actually that have moved on since then in real terms. And again, alongside that, amazing, amazing speakers from different hospices and different areas of care to again help us in terms of understanding where we are and where we need to be. So um, during the day, what we want to do is to make this as a starting point. So to understand that where, we, where we've been, where we are, and where we need to be going. And so that's got to be us all working together. And so we want you to share with us your thoughts and your ideas that provoked from the different sessions that you're here today. And we want to, in your goodie bag, there is a post-it note. And to use the post-it notes to put your thoughts and your ideas on here. Because again, today is a beginning. It's about looking at where we are, like I say, and where we need to be. And we are going to be developing workshops over the next few weeks and months for us to all work together to look at where we need to be strategically as we move forward. And those post-it notes will be a really useful starting point for me to have an understanding of where we are and what we need to be exploring in those workshops. So I really, really encourage you to, to um, contribute to that. In terms of evaluating the day, there's a survey monkey that'll be going out either tonight or tomorrow. It's got four very, very simple questions on it. The reason we've kept it simple is we want to make sure everybody responds, because again, the bigger it is, the more tedious it becomes and another job to do. So again, we really, really want your evaluation in terms of what is being said today and how it impacts on you in terms of where you are and where we need to be working with you to enable us all to move forward in the most positive way possible. Is that okay? So, I thought I'd start my presentation by just putting up a quote by Dame Barbara Munro. So, Barbara Munro was the CEO of St. George's, St. George's Hospice, sorry, St. Christopher's Hospice, that's you, St. George's, St. Christopher's Hospice um, down in London. And St. Christopher's Hospice was one of the very first hospices. Um, and it was led by Cicely Saunders, um, again, one of the pioneers in the hospice movement. She's also a trustee for Marie Curie and she's a great advocate and spokesperson for the hospice movement both nationally and internationally and this was something she shared very recently. Hospices have a unique opportunity as well as a responsibility to step up once again and play their part in achieving a new transformation. In its first flourishings hospice care brought creativity, confidence and compassion to new services that transform the lives and the deaths of many. Hospices should again work to put right an absence of care and an ignorance of need. So again, today is our starting point to begin to help us to understand where we've been, where we are, and where we need to go as a hospice. And, and that care provision within North Cumbria and for the children's hospice across the whole of Cumbria. And there's... Uh, uh, as we've already sort of mentioned, but from John, we know that change is a challenging thing for all of us. We all feel very comfortable in where we are and, and where we've been. So looking at change and looking moving forward can be a real challenge. But as Graham Wood said down in 2009, change has never happened this fast before and it will never be this slow again. So there's something about understanding where we are. We cannot stand still. We have to look at what we're doing and how we can grow and develop to make sure we're meeting the needs of the population that we serve. We know the challenges in terms of those changes are around increasing need for palliative and end-of-life care services. There's a drive around efficiencies in terms of you know, value for money. And you know, we, we, again, when we'll be talking today, we'll be looking at those challenges in terms of our funding. Um, we're looking at a sustainable workforce. 
What is the scale and type of workforce that we need to deliver what we need to deliver? What is the skill mix that goes with that? Our public and professional understanding of palliative care, about how we're working with our communities, how we're working across the different professional areas locally and nationally to achieve what we need to achieve to meet the needs of our client groups. We know in terms of regulation, we've moved from being seen as a care provision to a health provision. Again, there's lots of challenges with that. We had our MOX EQC, uh, which some of you will remember from a few weeks ago, it identified some fantastic practice that is going in the hospice, but also recognised things that we need to be doing to develop ourselves and to enhance the provision that we're offering to make mm -hmm. sure we get getting good, but and actually we should be aspiring for an outstanding in our next CQC. And inequalities, again, there's changing inequalities. How are we meeting those hard-to-reach population, the homeless, um, the people from ethnic minority groups, travelling communities? Where do they fit into the portfolio of the patients that we're caring for today and into the future? So, I thought I'd start again, but just by looking at our service, where are we now? So, we have at the moment, we've got a 12-bedded uh, adult inpatient unit. So, how do we see ourselves? Again, as an organisation, as people working there, how do we assess ourselves within that hospice? We have these facts and figures. And how do people externally see us? How does our local community understand us? Again, when I've been going around doing presentations recently, it's really interesting to see people's misunderstanding and misinterpretation of what ho the hospice service is. So at the moment, we've got a 12-bedded unit. Last year, our occupancy rate was 78%. The year before, it was 65%. So what is that telling us? Is that telling us we've got too many beds? Is that telling us that we've got an unmet need that we're not addressing? Or is it something else? So again, one of the things we need to start looking at and exploring is understanding that sort of information and what it means in terms of the provision that we're offering. We have a five-bedded child provision through Jigsaw. Uh, our current uh, patient numbers is around 58 on our caseload. So again, how is that in terms of addressing the needs of children with long-term, chronic, life-limiting conditions across the whole of Cumbria? Is the way that we're providing the provision the right provision? Are we capturing the right children? Um, are there different ways that we can be delivering that service to meet the families and the children's needs? And our day hospice, again, patients that come to day hospice just rave about it. They get such a fantastic service and it really meets their needs. However, Last year, we had 88, 88 patients. The year before, we had 91 patients. Are we actually meeting the needs of the wider population? Are there different ways that we could be actually delivering that service to meet a greater range of client groups? And again, within that, there's a whole range of services that we provide within the hospice that we need to be sort of considering, including, I think it's really important, and I put it on the list, was the eight shops that we have, because they serve the population, but they also help us in terms of our financial position. The shops are a real key component in terms of our funding and raising our profile as well out in the community. So as a hospice, just to give you a very quick overview in terms of our financial position, the annual cost of running the hospice is around £4 million. And of that, 21% we get from the NHS. So that, the, the funding we received from the NHS has been static for the last five years. That said, we did get a 1% increase in 17 and 18. But in real terms, it's going down because the money is staying the same, but our costs are going up. So there's something a real, a real challenge for us there in terms of what that means in terms of our fundraising. We need to have uh, three million pounds a year coming in through fundraising in all its different guises. So that's including our shops and our lottery, but also around a whole range of activities that, that, that our team provides within the hospice. So that's a real challenge for us. It works out that each week we have to raise 56,000 pounds just to stand still. So that's not about growth, that's not about capital investment, that's purely about day-to-day -day running costs of the hospice. We're incredibly privileged that we've got over 500 volunteers that provide their time, skills and enthusiasm to support the hospice. Last year it equated to 36,000 hours of support that they gave us. And if we actually turned that into monetary terms, it would have been £543,000 we would have had to find to replace the work that the volunteers provided for us. So we have got um, a, a sustainable um, 
group of staff. We've got 41 full-time staff and we've got 76 part-time staff. That costs us, in annual salaries, £2.8 million a year. And again, we do know that that's going to be going up year on year with a whole range of on costs that come with that. And again, we're looking at salaries within that. So that is a lot of money that we have to have just to stand still. And really, we need six months reserves. That's just to make sure that we've got something in the kitty in case things go wrong. And that really happened to us, and it really came home to us in 2015 when we had the storm Desmond and the flooding. So again, quite rightly, local money, which we are completely dependent on, and it was not, we're not depend, we don't get very, we get very little national money through funding streams. Most of our money is from the local population. And of course, that was transferred to people that were affected by the floods, quite rightly. But that had a huge nosedive in terms of our <coughs> funding. And if we hadn't have had those reserves, then it, we would have been in a really difficult situation. And we're just now starting to come out of that. We've got, like I say, around five months reserves at the moment, but we really like to get to six months to make sure that we have got that security, that sustainability option for us in case there is a, another storm Desmond or something similar. I just thought I'd very quickly, honestly, this will stop, really. Um, oh. Actually, I'll, go to, I'll do the demographics then first. So in terms of the demographics, again, one of the things we need to do when we're making our decisions around the hospice is look at the information that we have around us that can help to inform us, tangible information that can help to inform us. And again, it's then making sense of that information to show that we can use it in ways that can really help us in terms of improving our service. So we do know that by 2035, or we're told by 2035 nationally, there's going to be a 106% increase in the elderly population. That's people over the age of 65. We know that locally, in um, 2037, 65 plus age range will increase by 36%. That will be higher than the national average, which will be around 24%. So when we're looking at our local population, so the data I could get was for Allerdale, Carlisle, Eden and Copeland. That covers most of North Cumbria, I think. That equates to 227,000 population. So when we look at, so if we look, use cancer as an example, if for every 10,000 deaths in 2016, 76 people died of 76.3%, sorry, 76.3 people died of cancer. That means that in 2016, within North Cumbria, 1,731 people died of cancer. So why are we within that in terms of the provision that we're offering? So again, in, on its own, it's just giving us one bit of information. We need to look at how that equates to other things that are going on in terms of provision and where we see ourselves within that. Uh, and again, this came from POPNAT, which is Hospice UK data, which is incredibly fantastic and I would encourage you to use it. Uh, and that's telling us at that time, 4% of the population uh, in North Cumbria were using hospice inpatient services to meet their needs. So again, we need to look at those two bits of information together and the, the wider context to start to make sense of the information. But again, one of the things, again, what I've identified there are cancer, cardiovascular, respiratory, neurological conditions. I actually couldn't find the local information. I could only find the national information for that. But again, what we appreciate is that our patients are coming with single conditions. They're coming with multiple conditions. So again, there's something about understanding what it is that we need, our patients are needing and how we can best serve that. So just in terms of map, again, you can't see it very clearly, but nonetheless, this gives, and I can, but I can provide you with this information, it is in the hospice. Um, for the adult inpatient unit, we serve the north of Cumbria, and that gives us an indication of last year where our patients came from uh, that we served. So understanding that, you know, in, in the where we have a higher uh, proportion of people, so Carlisle, for example, you are going to get more patients. But we need to understand what that means in terms of the other areas. Is it that patients don't know that we have that service? Are we working with our professional groups properly to make sure that they know that they can refer patients to us? So we need to get that information. We need to understand how we best serve our local population in terms of the adult inpatient unit. Equally, as I mentioned before, our day hospice service, fantastic service, actually really, really meets the needs of patients that come to us. However, at the moment, it's primarily around the Carlisle area that we're serving. 
So we need to look at how we can capture and support patients across the whole of North Cumbria. We do, uh, with um, Hospice at Home in Carlisle, we do offer some service um, down in Penrith, a very small amount of um, in, uh, day hospice service in Penrith uh, within the hospital. But nonetheless, how do we serve that broader population? What is it that we need to be thinking about? What is it that we need to be doing? And again, with the children's hospice, we cover the whole of Cumbria. So when we're looking at that sort of scattered approach to the provision that we're offering for a range of children, are we meeting the needs of all the children that have those life-limiting conditions, chronic long-term conditions within Cumbria? Are there different ways that we can do it? We do know it's really, really hard to get the actual data around the number of children that need our care, but we need to look at the what we're doing, how we're doing it, and where we're doing it. So again, when we're looking at children down in Ulverston, that's a heck of a long way to come all the way up to Carlisle. Is there a different way that we can be serving that family and that child? So again, these are things that we need to start exploring and understanding. Um, recently, we had um, a visit from a chap called Nigel Hartley, who is a CEO of Mountbatten Hospice. Um, the reason we had him, he, he, they've done a tremendous amount of work over in the Isle of Wight, looking at transforming their hospice service and they're now merging with uh, Southampton um, Hospice Provision. And he presented to us um, the model that they're now using in terms of their hospice care. And they've taken uh, a very much a public health approach to the delivery of their care. And so, as you can see on that diagram, it very much starts by the underpinning being around public responsibility, around public education and community engagement. And it builds up so that the, at the peak of that is around the specialist service they're offering. So the bulk of their work is around that whole community engagement and working across the whole of the Isle of Wight in terms of looking at ways that they can work and connect with their community and educate their community. When we look at our hospice, it's the complete opposite of that. It's the complete reverse of that. So we are, in terms of, the, for our bottom rung, it's very much around, the bulk of the work we're doing is about that specialist care delivery. So there's something about looking at, if we're going to take a public health approach, what is it we need to be doing? How do we need to be changing in terms of looking at the delivery of services that we're offering? So um, uh, from, that, from that conversation, from that um, discussion, we've worked with, the, S the SMT have worked with the, the um, trustees to look at how we can go forward and understand what is it that we see that we are and we came up with this mission statement. And again, it's something that we will look at in our workshops. But this is our start of the 10, which is by 2025, everyone in our community with life-limiting conditions and palliative care needs will have access to excellent care in the right place at the right time. So again, it's about us working with the broader community to understand A, what people want, and B, what it is we can offer with other services to make sure that patients are getting what they want, where they want, when they want it. And part of that, of course, is within the hospice itself, but it's about understanding what that means. We also came up with um, four strategic aims around innovation, around inspiration, around investment, and around integration. So when we're talking about innovation, we're talking about looking at the hospice as being the centre of excellence for palliative care within our community. So we are the go-to place for all the all other groups when they're looking at the needs of their patients. That we support that through training um, and that we improve our reach. Looking at inspiration, what do we mean by inspiration? It's about making sure we get the, the trust and respect of our community. So they understand what, they, what we do and how we work with them because we need them. We need them in terms of volunteers. We need them in terms of them being participants. We need them in terms of our fundraising. So they want to, we want them to understand that it's so important for us to maintain the service and to do that, we need them to contribute into it. We also, in terms of inspiration, as I said before, in terms of the CQC, we want to be going for outstanding. We want to be seen as being that exemplar that we naturally know that we can be and that we know that we are. Investment, investing in our staff and our volunteers to make sure people have got the right skills that they need to actually provide the service that is required. 
And around integration, as I said before, working in partnership, um, making sure that we're really well connected and being recognised as that lead provider. And again, a lot of that work we're already doing, so it's about building on where we are to take us to where we need to be. And the only way that we can do that is working together as one team. And so one of the things, as I'm sure some, you'll all remember, is over the last few months, we've been looking at our values. And so we had a um, think tank around that, we've had our workshops around that, and from, it, from those discussions, uh, we came up with four key values. So they're not mutually, mutually exclusive, but they are the four key values that we all believe that we can work towards as one around caring that we always remember we are here for the benefit of our patients, their families and each other, about that respect for each other, that we have dignity, we are always aware of and consider the personal circumstances of others, and respect we treat everyone as an individual and professionally that we see ourselves as accountable, honest, inclusive and we never stop wanting to improve. So it's about, it's about us all working together with that very clear focus in terms of who we are, where we are, and where we're going. Thank you very much.